All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome. So glad that you're here. Welcome to our fireside chat about National Headquarters 18 month strategic plan. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Julia. I work for Campfire National Headquarters. My pronouns are she, her. I would love if all of you would put in the chat um, who you are, where you're from, what your pronouns are, and your connection to Campfire, just so we could get to know you a little better. Um, just so everyone knows, this is recorded. So um, we're recording right now. And if you have any questions along the way um, or any thoughts, please feel free to put those in the chat. Or if you're watching on Facebook Live, please put them in the comments and I'll make sure that we take care of that. And before we begin, um, we always try to start our meetings with a land acknowledgement. Um, we know that the lands that all of us are on are not um, the lands, that they're not ours, they're native to the peoples who came before us and the cultures that came before us. And we wanna be mindful and respectful of that. So we acknowledge that we are on stolen land and we thank the peoples who were came before us who cultivated this land and took care of this land. And we honor them and we keep them um, in our hearts and our minds and our plans as we move forward in our work. And I'm on the lands of the uh, Comanche, the Missouri, the Cheyenne, um, the Wyandotte and the Mississippi, among others. Please feel free to put the, the cultures of the lands you're on, if you know, in the chat. We'd love to know that as well. So without further ado, let's get started. So I want to introduce um, Shauna Rosenswag is our Chief Strategy Officer and Greg Zwaber is our CEO. And they're going to be talking to y'all about our National Headquarters 18 Month Strategic Plan, the goals we have for the next 18 months and beyond. So Take it away, Sean and Greg. Thanks, Julia. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see some familiar names and faces and some new ones uh, that maybe have not joined us before. But as Julia said, uh, my name is Greg Zwaber. I'm, I have the pleasure of being the CEO of Campfire National. I use he, him pronouns. I come to you from just north of Tampa, Florida. So we are in Super Bowl Haven here right now. I'm actually going to the uh, NFL experience tonight um, outdoors to do whatever that entails, I'm not sure yet. We'll be masked up and being socially distanced, I'm sure, but gonna try to go enjoy some fun outside. Um, I am here in Florida where I am, I'm on the land of the Tokoboga and the Seminole Indian tribes. Um, so we pay our respect to them. And again, like Julia said, to invite you to, if you're so inclined to um, put in the chat where, where the, the tribes that, the, the land that you live on. This is, I believe, is our fifth fireside chat, and it started out as a tried to be some, you know, a connection and outreach to our alumni across the country. Um, we've had fun with it. We did several of them last year, and we kind of took a little break, so it's been a few months since we've done them, but they're all recorded, and if you want to view any of the previous ones, they are at uh, campfire.org slash fireside chat, so you can go check out some of the other ones that we've had on a different array of topics, but we're excited to talk to you today about our strategic plan. And actually we, we talked about it on our network wide call with our CEOs and board chairs last week, but we didn't actually present the whole plan to them. So you will be the first, this is getting emailed out to them, I think as we speak or tomorrow, um, but you will be the first to see what is pretty much the final version of it, um, bearing a couple tweaks on some graphics and a couple uh, wordsmithing and things like that. But um, we're excited about it. We're gonna talk to you about kind of the process that we went through, which was very intentional, especially to make sure that we got youth voice heard uh, throughout the process and that our councils had a, a strong voice in the direction of what uh, Campfire and the network and our councils are gonna be headed towards too. Then we'll talk about, um, you know, we're not moving away from social emotional learning or youth development. That is what Campfire has been founded on, what we thrive on. Uh, so we're still all about that, but we're going to talk about how we're integrating um, the, the five commitments that we have in this 18 month plan into what all the councils are doing and doing the groundwork day to day with the youth um, in youth development and encompassing social emotional learning. And then we'll talk about kind of where we're at and what we're doing already and kind of some progress on some things that we're doing. So the first thing is uh, some of you may be asking, I've never heard of anybody doing an 18 month strategic plan. Why so short? Well, a couple things. You have to remember, we started this process back in August and we were in 
smack in the middle of the pande pandemic, hopefully in the middle at that point, if it doesn't continue to last uh, very much longer here. But there was certainly a bunch of uh, unknowns at that time. So we didn't want to pretend that that didn't exist. We were, if you think about August, we were in the the toils of uh, the racial and systemic injustice that was going on and all the riots and and all sorts of things that were happening at, at that time, protests, riots, all that, all that thing, all those things that were happening. So with that, we wanted to acknowledge that part of the plan going forward is just to get through this, right? Just to get through COVID. Um, you know, 2020 was a devastating year for a lot of our councils because some of them couldn't do any program at all, any programming at all, depending on where they were at in the country and what the lockdown measures that were taking place. We're so proud of the work that was done, um, and and it was a vast array of different things that were um, done by the councils to respond to the local need, whether that was providing emergency daycare for essential workers, um, doing virtual programming, which a lot of our, our councils did, uh, reaching out, keeping connected with the kids, even though if they couldn't do it one-to-one -one and couldn't go to camp or couldn't do an after-school program. So. We're very proud of the work that was done to keep the kids connected so that they weren't isolated even more than they already were with you know having to learn from, from home and all those types of things. So the reason we did an 18 month strategic plan is we felt like we had to do something that was concrete enough so that we can we know where we are a year and a half from now. So you'll see as we go through this, this is our 18 month uh, commitments and our goals for starting you know, uh, a month ago, January 1st of this year, going through the end of our fiscal year next year, which will end June 30th, 2022. So it's a concrete set of commitments for the next 18 months with a vision of what we'll look like as a network five years from now. So we'll go through some of those and how that timeline and the difference between 18 months and five years um, came about. So this first one just kind of describes a little bit of the process. So we started in August, as I said, we held some virtual community forums um, so that people could give input. Council CEOs, council staff, board members, alumni, youth, I think again, one of the most important parts, national staff, national board, um, members of our youth advisory cabinet, that's part of the national office and, and the national board. Um, we formed after that a strategic planning task force that had national staff members, national board members, council representatives from all different backgrounds, um, but especially from CEOs. Uh, and again, the, the, the National YAC Youth Advisory Cabinet members. And um, yeah, so that I guess that's a, the, the, and some outside experts that kind of gave us some uh, influence our, our, our process as well. So as a result of that, this is what we came up with, what we presented to the council network and the CEOs back in October at our CEO summit really listen so that we knew what were we missing, what were we hitting home on, what needed to be added, what needed to be tweaked. And so this we present to you now is kind of, is our finished product and where we're headed over the next 18 months and with a vision for the next five years. Go ahead, Julia. So again, we put this in here because we wanted to be just transparent with it. We're, we're in a time of unknown here when we did started this process and Still to some degree, although I think our, a lot of our councils feel a lot better about 2021, uh, there's still you know, areas around the country where there's severe uh, restrictions on, on gatherings and, and whether we can do programming with the kids. But a lot of the areas, it's beginning to open up and there's potential for after school programs to start on a broader scale. We have some of our councils doing a phenomenal job with, again, with responding to a need in their local community. But also there is a renewed confidence, I think, across our network it, that um, there's the potential and the pr probability that summer camp will happen in day camp form and in resident camp form. We just presented to our council CEOs um, uh, the uh, information that the American Camp Association came with in their study of last year and the number of camps that held both day camps and resident camps and how they did so very, very safely and with less uh, transmission rate than just the common population. So we do feel hopeful about 2021 and getting back to um, some sense of normalcy when it comes to camp, day camp and or resident camp moving forward. So, but we realized this was a huge hit, huge hit to our councils financially, regardless of their situation and where they were at uh, across the country. Go ahead, Julia. 
Shauna, you, this is where Shauna's going to, Shauna and I are going to kind of jump in back and forth so y'all don't have to just listen to me babble the entire time. Go ahead, Shauna. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so the origin of our strategic commitment. So as Greg mentioned, um, there was a strategic planning task force made up of council representatives, national staff members, board members, and young people themselves uh, involved in Camp Fire. So this cohort of individuals uh, came together to really look at kind of what were some of the core elements of the Camp Fire experience, what we call our program framework, that we wanted to use as anchors or pillars uh, for the strategic planning process. And so through that, um, through a series of focus groups and interviews that had taken place previously to identify kind of the core campfire experience or campfire journey, as we like to call it, uh, they identified three pillars upon which uh, to base this plan. Uh, so regardless of if you're an alumni of campfire, if you're in campfire today, or maybe you are, will be in campfire in the future, uh, all, all young people in our programs will have the opportunities to experience these three things. Diverse, equitable environments that are inclusive of all young people, adults who prioritize youth, and experiential learning in, for, or about the community or outdoors. So we took those three elements of the program framework and really used those as a foundation to identify a series of strategic commitments and goals within that. And then again, we looked for alignment um, with the organization statement of inclusion, uh, which reads, right, Campfire believes in the dignity and intrinsic worth of every human being. We welcome, affirm, and support young people and adults of all abilities and disabilities, experiences, races, ethnicities, socioeconomic backgrounds, sexual orientations, gender identities and expressions, religion and non-religion, citizen and immigration status, and any other category people use to define themselves or others. We strive to create safe and inclusive environments that celebrate diversity and foster positive relationships. So I wanted to read that just to, again, make sure that we're all kind of grounded in Campfire Statement of Inclusion. That's a, a, an updated version. Uh, so that we can recognize that all young people, right, deserve the opportunity to embark on the campfire journey and to have these opportunities, right, to engage in um, experiential learning with adults who prioritize youth and um, in diverse, equitable environments. So we also wanted to focus on our connection to social emotional learning. As Greg mentioned, it's not something it's a non-negotiable, right, for campfire. It's something we, we will always do. And we often talk about social emotional learning as thriving. And so one of the lenses that uh, the committee kind of kept at, when looking at this was how can we be meeting the needs of our most vulnerable and ensuring that everyone is thriving, uh, not just some youth, but all youth are having the opportunity to thrive. And so with that, um, we identified a series of ways that Campfire promotes social emotional learning and ways in which it supports diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so uh, some of these examples are that social emotional learning in Campfire recognizes and invites in the wide range of identities and assets that program participants and staff bring to Campfire. So in other words, you can be your whole authentic self in Campfire. Uh, that social emotional learning is a pathway to youth voice, agency, and action. In Campfire, young people develop the skills necessary to create a more just and equitable world. So in essence, this really captures the power of dreaming, right? That young people are able to come together and to imagine a, a better world, a more just world, and then take action to, to create that. That professional development, right, training for our staff and volunteers is focused on social emotional learning, uh, for adults to provide them with a lens to reflect on their own skill set, gain tools for reflection on both systemic and individual biases and inequities, and engage in culturally responsive practices, right? So that any young person, any adult who's interacting with a young person in a campfire program is open to understanding their own worldviews and identities and how those may impact how they show up with young people. That social emotional development is a team effort, right? Campfire doesn't exist in a vacuum, but we are part of a broader community and ecosystem that young people are a part of, including their schools, their families, and other community-based organizations. And it's our responsibility to be working collaboratively with them, to be in community. And lastly, Campfire acknowledges that most social emotional learning standards are rooted in Eurocentric norms. And so we are actively engaging in um, translating research to practice and looking for new and emerging best practices that bring together a wide range of definitions that allow young people to bring their own culture and faith and experiences into how they define thriving uh, to, to be their full selves and reach their full potential. 
Okay, so this slide is, if we just took one and said, here's what we're gonna do. The left side is really about what we're envisioning, uh, all the work that we're gonna do in the next 18 months and over the five years, what will look like campfire. And on the right side is our strategic commitments for the next 18 months. So these are our commitments that we're going to do as the national headquarters. And a lot of it integrates the work that we would do at the councils. But if you see here, our five-year vision, I don't wanna read it to you, but it's really talking about a sustainable organization that's gonna break down any barriers. So we've talked about, you know, we've used the word liberation for it, meaning like if there's any barrier, whether that's socioeconomical, uh, gender-based, race-based, what any barrier whatsoever that might keep any youth uh, in our in our communities from being able to access our programming, any programming, we want to break those down. How do we make it so that when we say all are welcome, which I truly believe Campfire is that all feel welcome, they know about us, if they want to be engaged with us, they have the opportunity to do so. So breaking, da breaking down those uh, structural barriers and increasing the uh, access, opportunity to access so that there are no barriers to access going forward. So in doing that, we believe in becoming an, our truly equity-focused fo equity organization where there aren't those barriers to participation, regardless of what the, the child's or uh, the youth circumstances are. So. Here are our five strategic commitments, again, tied into youth development and social emotional learning. We're, we're, not, we're not parting from those, but things that we're gonna focus on in the next 18 months. One is advanced diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and access. Again, breaking down those barriers that we may have right now. Two is engage in an, actively anti-racist practices. The uh, question came up, does that mean we were racist before? No but we're going to be actively anti-racist in everything we do going forward. And we're gonna concentrate on that for the next 18 months so that we can say that we're a truly equity focused organization on the other side of this. Number three is address and end cultural appropriation. So again, that's our goal at the national office. We'll talk about that when we get to that slide specifically, but we want to take those things that probably on, on all cases, I believe had good intentions and maybe good thoughts behind them, a good connection to start with, but if we're appropriating something uh, uh, that we shouldn't be, we've done a lot of work with that and we wanna address that and end that. And then invite and encourage the councils to do that. Maybe not necessarily have it all done in the next 18 months, but again, a, a vision of five years from now, we nobody would look at campfire and say that we're appropriating anything um, with the indigenous culture or any culture for that matter. Uh, number four is honor the power of our young people with meaningful participation and dis decision making. So this is lifting up the youth voice, um, not just saying, hey, we, we want to know what you think or whatever, but really giving them a seat at the table and encouraging them uh, to, to help us uh, refine and define our decision making going forward as an organization. And then number five is promote in environmental stewardship and action. And this is really about you know getting back to our core. This is what Campfire was founded on. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to, uh, you know, a council has to have a camp or anything like that necessarily. It, location isn't the important part, but getting back to promoting, get the, the idea of getting kids outdoors and then and teaching some environmental education and stewardship along with that. So those are five strategic commitments for Campfire National and the five-year vision that that's tied into as we move forward. Okay, so for the first one, again, I'm not, I don't wanna read these to you. These will be available to you afterwards and it'll be, the recording will be on our website with the other ones too. Um, but here is really what we're doing. And what we started with these, and I will read the first part is we tried to put in there, why is this a strategic commitment for us? So advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion and access for us it is important because we believe that all youth deserve to be seen, heard and valued so that they can live today and in the future as their full selves, bring their whole selves to Campfire, right? This is Campfire's basic promise to our participants. To deliver on this promise, we strive to create safe and inclusive environments for Campfire youth while we're removing the barriers that keep some from full participation in our programs. These environments are created and evaluated intentionally and deliberately. Our commitments to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and access within our organization is a commitment to action. So again, this isn't just us making a statement or putting something out there that says, you know, all are welcome or inclusive. We're really, this is about embracing it 
and breaking down any of the barriers so that any kid can bring their whole selves to campfire. I truly believe that our councils do a phenomenal job when the kids show up of allowing that 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 youth to, to you know present them whole cell their whole cells and be them their whole cells. This is again about how do we break down barriers so we get more kids the ability to be a campfire. What I, I, I firmly believe that probably everybody on this call thinks that wouldn't it be great if every single kid in the United States had access to campfire? So this is what we're talking about. How do we make that so that we are completely accessible for any kid to bring their whole cells? So here's our five things that we're going to commit to. Um, one of them is talking about authoring a, a clear vision and mission, and it's to support our promise. So we have the campfire promise right now in our language that we use. We want to have a clear mission and vision so that anybody in our network, whether you're a staff member, a board member, a volunteer, when somebody says to you, what is campfire? You can say campfire is, and it, you don't have to, you don't have to refine it and make it just what it, campfire is at your local council. To me, that's about telling people what you do specifically, mean what type of programming, where you do it, whether or not you have a camp, but this authoring a clear mission and vision is about saying campfire is in one or two sentences so that we're all speaking the same language and eventually everybody knows exactly what campfire is whether you've been involved with it or not okay and then second one is uh, about a professional development plan to increase the knowledge of our, our council staff and the national staff about what it means to really uh, be aware and express the urgency related to, to diversity equity inclusion and access um, then we're going to develop a template that that will be able to be used to measure like how we're moving along with this. How are we increasing diversity, equity, inclusion, and access at the national office, and there and and hopefully throughout the entire network. And then we'll do a toolkit to help councils with that, um, and a kind of assess where they're at with it and how how they can improve. What we're really excited about is we don't um, presume or think at the national office that we have all the answers. We have a wealth of knowledge in our council network, and we're going to hone that knowledge and really bring up best practices and who's doing things well. We'll also talk to, to, to councils and bring forward of like where they stubbed their foot and really didn't do well and learned, learned from making mistakes and things like that. So that councils that are taking on this more seriously going forward can learn from, you know, what to do, what not to do. Um, and then along with this is we're, you know, always have a constant focus on child safety and our policies and our practice to ensure that as we do all this and increase access, that uh, the youth that we serve are continue to be very protected. So that is number one of advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Again, what we're going to do at the national headquarters over the next 18 months. And a lot of this have, has already started or, or it's work in progress. Go ahead, Julia. Perfect. So number two is engage in actively anti-racist practices. So as Greg mentioned, right, we have a why statement for each of these. And, and for this one, it says, being an anti-racist organization is not a static process. We staff, volunteers, funders, youth, parents, school partners must commit to it each and every day. There are no shortcuts. Organizational, organizational commitment to anti-racist practices means that we at Campfire are not merely signaling support for anti-racism, we're, we're doing the engagement work to proactively counteract social inequities. So again, anti-racism really defined as actively working against racism and acknowledging that this is the world young people are living in right now. We've seen uh, racism, individual and structural racism, right, through, through a number of different ways, whether it's through COVID-19, through the structural violence uh, that representative of the racism in our country. It's a world that our young people are living in and a reality that we need to acknowledge as an organization and help support them to create changes to work, to work through it and to imagine a better future for all of us. So to do this at the national headquarters, uh, we're going to articulate clear, consistent messaging on our organizational values related to equity, um, along with metrics that, uh, to determine what it means to be an anti-racist organization. So something we can evaluate and measure ourselves against. Uh, offer training that's tailored to the Campfire Network specifically on anti-racist practices. Uh, build our own organizational capacity to, to make sure we're recruiting and retaining racially diverse staff and board members across the Campfire Network. And we're identifying partnerships, again, working in community that embody and represent the lived experiences of Black, Indigenous, and people of color for young people. So with that, we'll go on to number three. Okay, 
this is the one that might be sensitive to a higher number of folks on the call and, and alumni. So we recognize that. But part of what we did through the process, um, through a grant that we got from the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation, was to do an audit of some of the practices and, and traditions and things like that, that that happen across our network, whether at national or in practice on you know a day-to-day -day basis uh, at, at the councils. And what we learned through that was that there, there are certain things, that, again, well-intentioned and never meant to do harm. And the biggest thing we realized, I think, through this through the audit was that there was a homog homogenization of indigenous culture. So doing certain things or practices or songs or using certain words that just assumed that it was you know, an indigenous practice when there are many, many, many different uh, indigenous tribes across the, across the country and many more that existed before. So again, the why statement I'll read to you here is, is very intentional based on what we learned and where we wanna go with this. So a primary mechanism for cultural appropriation is power. Who has the power when we're using cultural appropriation, especially when dominant cultural organizations trivialize and adopt aspects of other cultures without proper attribution, consent, or benefit to the people and cultures from where they were taken. So again, who has the power? It's those that are doing the cultural appropriation without consent or acknowledgement to the group that's doing it. So given Campfire's history of homogenizing indigenous symbols, words, and practices, it's imperative that we examine our responsibility and continue continuing to halt misrepresentation and exploitation of Native American and Indigenous people and their cultures. So our commitment, again, over the next 18 months, the national headquarters will, one, conduct further exploration into our materials and the practices uh, for cultural appropriation so we can continue to learn more. Two is, again, this professional development around the understanding and acknowledgement of the cultural appropriation and what we need to do to respond to it. This one is probably the most important one, I think, in this whole process is with the indigenous communities, determine how to acknowledge that we've done this appropriation and, and how do we address that harm? Um, how do we say sorry for it if we need to in some cases? Or are there some cases where they, the indigenous communities that our council's in may say, it is okay if you do A, B, and C. We respect that. We want you to continue that. There may be cases of that as well. And we want to acknowledge that as well. This isn't just a complete wiping out of anything uh, that, that's been done that might be tied to in indigenous uh, peoples. But we want to be cognizant of the power and give it back to them and have them acknowledge whether it is respectful, disrespectful, or honoring them or not honoring them and not make the assumption that it does any of those. So again, we'll develop a self-assessment tool so that councils can, can look at the cultural appropriation that they may be doing at the local level. And then uh, again, a youth driven process to revise our reward and, and recognition items. So if we need to change some of those items, which we do, then we wanna hear from the youth about uh, what that should be going forward. What we heard over and over from the youth is, uh, if you look at things that go through uh, the process for, for any of the youth in, in getting the recognition and you know, in a lot of cases, wearing a gown and putting a bead on it or things like that, it isn't necessarily the gown that was worn or the bead that was earned. It was what was done in order to achieve that or to, to get that accomplishment, to get that recognition. So we don't wanna do away with that. We wanna do away with my, what might be appropriative. So again, we don't wanna just come up and say, this is what the new thing is gonna be. We want the youth, some youth who have been uh, through it, some who are going through it now, for them to revise the rewards and say, this is what the recognition process is. And we had a great discussion about this with all the councils and ideas were flying all over the place about what was done. And some of the councils have already moved on and are doing different things to, to do reward and recognition through, throughout the process for a youth that's going through it. Um, and then the last one is, we are going to, to talk about some minimum expectations for councils to do in the 18 month process. So we, we we're, there'll be certain things we say, we need to stop this now or ASAP. And then there'll be other things we say, we got to get on the, the path of doing this, but we want to make sure that it's all done. So again, at the end of five years, nobody could look at the national office or any of our councils and say, that's appropriating a, a, you know, a certain culture. So that's the goal. So we'll come up with some minimum expectations for the councils to move along 
in the next 18 months and over the next five years. Go ahead. Perfect. So number four is honor the power of young people with meaningful participation and decision making. So this is really something we see as one of Campfire's superpowers, right? It, it has been our organization's superpower and will continue to be as we amplify it through this strategic plan. So looking at the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, right? Racism, exclusion, inequity, and cultural appropriation are human made and they can be unmade, right? That's the good news. So Campfire as an organization that exists for young people and we believe in sharing power and giving ownership to young people to create the program, the organization and the world they desire. We do this by prioritizing youth participation in decision-making both in our organization and in their lives more broadly. So to amplify a youth voice and the power of young people, uh, we're going to conduct an audit of current practices across uh, the organization uh, to define a roadmap for how we can be amplifying youths, uh, um, the opportunities for young people to engage in decision making um, and contributing to campfire. So we're going to uh, identify a clear purpose for the National Youth Advisory Cabinet and launch recruitment efforts to bring more people onto our national YAC. Um, upon completion of the first two items, we're going to create and curate um, a series of training uh, materials and resources for councils uh, to amplify youth power in action through programs, activities, and governance structures. So that could be supporting a council to create their own youth advisory cabinet, bringing young people onto their board of directors. It could be expansion of, of leadership development programs within their council, in their council. So looking at things like counselor and training programs and how can we translate those to school year programs to support young people in their after school programs to have a similar leadership pipeline that we know works so well within, within camping programs. And then lastly, uh, making sure that at the national headquarters, uh, we have a designated staff person uh, to provide support and coaching uh, to our councils on, and to young people themselves on this topic of youth power in action. So again, making sure that we have the resources and support and structures in place uh, to make sure that young people who are the heart and soul of this organization are the ones that are uh, meaningfully engaging in, in the decision-making process, both for the organization and for their communities more broadly. Okay, last one, and then we'll open it up for you all to give any questions, comments, or snide remarks. We take them all. Um, but the last one is promote environmental stewardship in action. Again, here's our why statement with it is connecting young people to nature has been a core aspect of campfire programs since 1910, from the very beginning. We recognize that the realities of identity, power, and agency inform the environmental issues affecting young people and communities. And Campfire strives to create opportunities for young people to connect with and learn about nature and advocate for environmental justice in their own communities. By promoting environmental stewardship and justice, Campfire is acting within and toward a framework of social justice while youth learn how to engage and contribute in the world around them. Again, getting back to our core here, and most of our councils already do this, but it's, we're talking about emphasizing it. And it, again, it doesn't matter location here. It's about, you know, getting kids outdoors when possible, or even uh, helping them learn about outdoors if they have to be inside. So we talk a lot about like, we're not going to eliminate screen time, but can we engage and, and have councils, if kids are going to be on screen time, can we give them something productive to learn about the outdoors and the environment? So our commitments here uh, over the next 18 months, uh, we're going to, again, we're not, the, we're not the super smart ones in our network. The council people are. So they're the ones that are doing this work. So we're gonna identify and elevate those council best practices and programs. And so that other councils can learn from uh, the councils that are really doing a, a great job in this area already. After that, then we'll align some current program, uh, programmatic efforts to environmental stewardship and action. So really at the beginning, it's about getting kids outdoors again, which is important anyways, with everything going on with COVID-19 and then elevating the best practices that already exist across our network, but then really incorporating all that in afterwards. Again, creating tools, curriculum, competency-based training for our councils. And then the last one is to scale. This is the name of a grant we currently have called the Camper Grant, but it's Camp Accessibility, Meaningful Participation, and Equal Representation. Um, we currently are funded by the Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies out of uh, Minnesota. We currently have 10 councils in that, and it's all about increase, you know, it goes back to our, our number one commitment, increasing accessibility, being inclusive uh, with that specific grant has a focus on kids who have uh, uh, kids who have uh, 
some form of disability, kids who identify as LGBTQ+, and kids who uh, struggle uh, social economically possibly. So we want to take that grant and we're in conversations with Margaret A. Cargill now to expand that from, from 10 uh, current councils and expand that to seven to 10 and possibly even more. We're having a conversation about it being even, even more broad than that. So again, it's about inclusion, it's about access, and it's about breaking down barriers for any kid to be able to come enjoy, especially our camps. And some of that's physical improvements, some of that's training, some of that's, all, it's all sorts of different things that go into that. But it's about when any kid shows up, that when we say you are welcome here, that they feel welcome there. Um, and there's people that look like them and feel like them and, and they feel comfortable with that. So that's the primary goal of that camper grant. And we're looking to expand that as a big part of both the environmental stewardship part and getting kids outdoors, but also about breaking down barriers and improving access. Okay, that's a lot, we realize. Um, we wanna make sure we leave plenty of time. We get 20 minutes here. So feel free to put anything in the chat. If I don't, Julia, do you have anything from the Facebook Live where folks have questions or comments with it? Uh, feel free also to unmute yourself and, and go ahead and say something if you'd like or ask a question. Um, we are all ears and here for you to answer anything. So far, oh, we got one in Zoom. Are there plans to invite increased participation of indigenous youth and in campfires? If yes, who should I contact to learn more? I currently work with Indigenous youth through an Upward Bound program. So I would say yes, broadly. It's about, again, in breaking down barriers and in, in, in increasing accessibility. So that is across all peoples, including Indigenous people. So again, I think you know a lot of the traditions and cultures were founded in, 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 with the idea of honoring and respecting the Indigenous folks. So if we're going to be in conversation with them anyways about hey, is this okay that we're doing this? Or do you feel honored with this? Why not invite them to our programs and to our camp and to our after school program as well? So yes, but it, not just limited to indigenous youth uh, uh, to answer that question. One thing I'll throw in uh, just to, to as a thought here or maybe a call to action. If anything we're doing here over the next 18 months inspires you, or you have an area of expertise in, or you know somebody that does, or you know a, an organization, whether it's a corporation or a foundation or something that believes in some of these same things that we're focusing on going forward, I invite you to reach out to myself or any of us at the national staff and, and you know make an introduction. If you want to help yourself, we'll, we'll happily take you on. We can't pay you, but <laughs> we'll take you on if you're willing to volunteer some expertise or thoughts or whatever it is at, in helping us accomplish these commitments over the next 18 months and beyond. A quiet crew again. As folks are typing questions, um, you know, one of the things that really excites me about uh, this strategic plan is is that it, I think, really builds on kind of our organizational history and and the alumni, right, our our organizational ancestors that have kind of come before us, and you know, we've heard countless stories, you know, certainly over over my time here of, you know, whether it was, you know, fighting for women to have equal rights for men, or, you know, we recently heard a story from the U.S. Holocaust Museum of a, a, a young woman in campfire who, you know, supported a family to escape Nazi Germany and come to the United States. But again, you know, or the um, actions and advocacy work that uh, campfire youth did in the 1990s to support advocacy around HIV AIDS that this is an organization that throughout its history, right, we have this really rich legacy of young people learning about themselves, right, exploring all of who they are, and then using that, showing up in community with one another to create change. And I think this uh, strategic plan really speaks to kind of the next chapter of, of what's to come for Campfire and the young people that are part of the organization. So again, I think a really fun um, and exciting time to, to tackle some really big challenges, uh, but you know, all through this you know, kind of amazing goal of ensuring that all young people have the opportunity to, to thrive and to flourish. So 
um, I'm definitely makes me proud to be a part of, of this organization. Shauna, do you want to address this of uh, I put in could could you share more about what youth expressed in the forums as you were determining the goals? Yeah. So yeah, so part of our process, um, as Greg had mentioned before, was was host, hosting a series of virtual community forums, right? So that we could be inviting in um, not only staff, but young people, program participants from, from across the country that are part of campfire programs. And one thing we, we heard over and over from young people and also going back to some focus group data we had collected the previous summer uh, related to the camper initiative that, that Greg mentioned, is that young people wanted campfire to do more, right? It wasn't enough to, to say that we, um, you know, we're opposed to, to what's happening, but really, again, it was about campfire creating opportunities for action. And, and I think we saw that with everything from, you know, the opportunity for youth voice, right? It was more than do they have voice and choice in programs, but how can we truly be helping to, to lift up young people and to let their, you know, kind of their power fully, fully bloom? Um, you know, and with environmental stewardship and action. Again, it wasn't enough to be stewards of the environment, but how could we be supporting young people to take action around, you know, pressing issues related to climate change and climate justice, um, and thinking about how all of these pieces intertwine. So as a result, I think we've seen five commitments emerge that really is the young people in Campfire saying, these are the elements of equity that we would like this organization to be addressing and that we're, we're living day in and day out. And you know, Campfire has created a space for us to come together and talk about these things in ways that we may not be able to in the classroom. And so how can we utilize that that power and that potential to create some positive change? So uh, that's, yeah, kind of the gist of what we learned uh, from young people and, and we'll continue to engage them in this conversation, both showing how we're making changes based on what they've asked for, but then also continuing to, to get their input um, and their thoughts on how we move forward as an organization. Add to that really quick, the land acknowledgement that we did at the beginning, um, we really started making that a priority after the youth forums because the youth mentioned that was really important to them. And there's a lot of youth that have been already doing that at their council. So um, yeah, the youth forums are really interesting. I think that's probably one of the things that uh, I feel the most proud about through this process is we we really involved them throughout the entire process. And it wasn't just like, well, give us your feedback after you know a group of adults met and said, here's where we're going. It was proactively including them in the conversation from the very beginning and throughout the entire process. And they were probably the most vocal, <laughs> which was great to see. They were not, they did not hold back when it is, you know, when, when we started talking about certain aspects of cultural appropriation, they were the loudest. And they were the ones that said, hey, we got to recognize this. And hey, we got to stop this. And hey, we might have to apologize for this. And hey, let's come up with something alternative to this. That was the youth who were the loudest about it and the most animate about it. So it was really good to see that, you know, what we ended up with and making sure we have youth voice and youth power as one of our commitments. We embraced that through this entire process, which is probably why it's in there as a strategic commitment, because they wanted it in there. And we wanted in there as well. So uh, I'm I'm proud that this whole process was inclusive, which we're talking about. And we gave access to folks to to give feedback after and before and during, and anybody could have been a part of the the process with it. I'm really thankful for the task force that put a lot of hours into this over um, you know the months of August through December. Um, really spent you know t at times you know, an hour and a half or two hour meeting. I think we had one three, three hour virtual meeting, but really put a lot of time into it. And people came really engaged. Uh, there was very few, if any, during the meetings where people didn't speak their mind and really give their opinion on where we're going and what we should be doing or how something should be said. So I really feel really proud about the process that we went through to get to where we're at and presenting this to you here today. And I feel um, I'm just excited about that we have something to not redirect us because I think that this is all things that Campfire has felt that we've been doing before and we just have an opportunity to do it even better. And really, I think it's an opportunity for us to stand up and, and create our own space with it and for people to recognize we've been doing this and we're going to do it better going forward.
Any last closing thoughts or comments, questions from anyone? If not, we appreciate you all taking the time to join us. And again, this will be uh, posted if you want to share it um, with anybody. It'll be on our website, campfire.org slash fireside chat going forward. And again, you can see the, the previous ones that we've done with that as well. So with that, everybody continue to be safe. Uh, hopefully we have some return to normalcy before the summer here and at your councils. Hopefully kids are outside and enjoying the, the summer camp, day camp and overnight camps uh, as they always have in our network and can do so and really appreciate it. So appreciate you all taking the time to join us and we'll talk to you all soon. Take care.